So um, I know about Rajiv's work for a while because he has a track record of publishing very um, impressive, globally relevant papers in high impact journals. Um, a lot of these include uh, remote sensing techniques, but he also has experience with on the ground field work including in Borneo, where um, nearby to some of the places where I worked, and has um, a lot of colleagues that I know from, from Asia, but also colleagues that you will know from CBCS, including Oscar Venter, James Watson, and, um, and others. And so um, I've been told uh, that Rajiv prepared a short uh, introductory slide. So I will only quickly give you his academic credentials uh, he did his PhD at the University of Florida, and then he's uh, went back to India before coming to uh, uh, Canada at University of British Columbia, um, U University of Northern British Columbia. Yeah, that's correct. Northern British Columbia. And um, where he's now a postdoc uh, with Oscar Venter. So with that, I will hand it over to, to you. Thank you, Matthew. Let me just uh, share my slides just to make sure that uh, and just a uh, one last thing is um, we're hoping Rajiv will come to join us next year on a um, ARC DECRA fellowship if all goes well. Uh, thank you, Matthew. Uh, Matthew and everyone, can you see my screen? Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks, Matthew, for the intro. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. And thank you for inviting me to talk. Uh, my name is Rajiv Pillay. I'm currently based in Canada. And today I'll be talking mostly about my postdoctoral work. Um, so before I start, just a short introduction about myself. So I am an applied ecologist by training and I am especially interested in biodiversity conservation issues in the tropics. I began my research career at uh, an NGO in Southern India called the Nature Conservation Foundation. And over there, I worked on um, you know, collecting data from indigenous people, as well as other interviewees, uh, people who live and work in the Western Ghats biodiversity hotspot. So the Western Ghats is a mountain chain that runs along the entire west coast of India. It's primarily tropical rainforest, uh, and it is home to several uh, endemic species, such as the lion-tailed macaque. And it's also a global stronghold for tigers and for the Asian elephant. It's, uh, it's got some uh, mixed deciduous and drier forest as you go further north. So I've basically traversed the entire length and breadth of this area, interviewing people about the observations of wildlife and then using these data in an occupancy modeling framework to understand their distributions. Uh, from here, I went to Florida and I did my PhD at UF in Gainesville at the Department of Wildlife Ecology and Conservation. Uh, and although I was based in the UF, uh, I did my PhD fieldwork in Sabah in Malaysian Borneo. I worked in the, uh, at the field sites of the stability of altered forest ecosystems or the SAFE project in Borneo. And my work in Borneo was, uh, or my PhD was primarily focused on understanding the effects of selective logging on ecological processes. And I looked at two processes, one was seedling recruitment and the other was using bioacoustics to, to understand how weather and how uh, birds sing differently in log forests versus primary forests. Um, since leaving UF, I've been uh, based at UNBC in Canada. So I live really close to the Arctic now, but I've I'm very happy to report that I still work in my beloved tropical forests. I've still managed to, uh, despite the fact that I live uh, five months a year in ice and snow. So I'm still able to focus on tropical forests for my research. And today, um, my work is uh, no longer, sadly, at a field-based level. It's more of a global uh, computer-based uh, modeling at a global scale. So today, I'm going to talk about two aspects of my work uh, uh, concerning tropical forests and their conservation. Mm, the first aspect is a paper that we just published a few months ago last year. And the second aspect uh, is going to be on a paper that we currently have that's in review, uh, under peer review right now. Um, so when we generally think about tropical forests as such, we um, think about you know, the ecosystem services they provide as benefits for humanity. 
we think about their climate regulation potential. Um, but one thing that really pops out to us typically when we think about tropical forests is their sheer diversity of life. So tropical forests are renowned to be the repositories of biodiversity. You know, they have more species than all other uh, biomes in the world, or at least that's what we have heard of uh, uh, said over and over and over again. Uh, but when it comes to the total number of species in tropical forests, does anybody know how many species there are actually in tropical forests? So if you are familiar with the tropical forest literature, you will often find uh, statements. Uh, uh, generally, it's a, it's a very common thing, like such as this paper in Science by Simon Lewis and colleagues, where they say that tropical forests harbor half of all of Earth's biodiversity. Um, and then this paper in uh, Nature by Josh Barlow and colleagues, uh, where they say that the tropics contain the overwhelming majority of Earth's biodiversity. So um, as I was going through some of, some of this, uh, you know, you, you, you kind of wonder um, what is the data that really backs up these kinds of statements. Uh, um, and I did, I did some early uh, so searches of the, of the literature during the early part of my postdoc. And generally what I found is that everything comes back to this particular paper published in 1982 in this journal called the Coleopterists Bulletin. So Coleoptera are the order of beetles, um, uh, insects. And if you love beetles, um, if by any chance you're very interested in beetles, this would be the place to look for whatever information that you might want, or really detailed information on beetles. It's still being published today. And uh, Terry Irwin in 1982, uh, you know, used counts of species of beetles from one tree species in Panama and 19 individuals of the species. So he went and surveyed 19 uh, trees of the same species in Panama and uh, counted the number of species of beetles and then did some extrapolation from that. And um, roughly very crudely estimated that there are 30 million species of invertebrates in tropical forests around the world. So as you can imagine, the sample size is really low here. Uh, we just have one species and 19 individuals and then you're extrapolating to tropical forests worldwide. Subsequently, um, the late great E.O. Wilson uh, in his seminal book, Biodiversity, he cited Irwin and he, he then made the statement that tropical forests contain more than half of the world's biota. So over time, um, E.O. Wilson's uh, statement has really become kind of a near mantra in the literature. And everybody has been citing either Irwin or E.O. Wilson, and sometimes people cite the most recent work. So you don't really have much data to, uh, to back up, to either uh, you know, um, uh, back up the claim or maybe even refute it, surprisingly, if that would be a great surprise. Um, so why is this the case? Why, why is there uh, uh, such little data on biodiversity in the tropics, uh, in terms of number of species at least? So in general, uh, it's really hard to count species. So today I'm currently based in Canada and it's a temperate uh, region. I'm not very far from the Arctic, but if I were to walk outside right now, and if I were to sample the soil in, uh, in quadrats, uh, 10 meters apart, let's say, I would be fairly uh, likely to have different communities of microorganisms like bacteria, fungi, et cetera, in different quadrats. And um, uh, so, you know, biodiversity comprises everything, right? It's not just uh, uh, mammals and birds, but it's also bacteria, it's also fungi, it's also viruses. So um, counting species is hard. And this is about soil microorganisms in, uh, you know, 10 meter uh, in like small like quadrats. But what if you had to count species across the entire tropical forest biome? The orange uh, here shows the extent of the tropical forest biome between the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn. Um, and overall, it would be a pretty daunting challenge to count species here, whether you're looking at uh, species that you can see, uh, like birds, mammals, etc., etc., or even or even more difficult if you are wanting to count uh, smaller smaller taxa. Um, secondly, the 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 distribution of species must be known, so you know you need to know where species occur to be able to tell how many species there are, uh, and that distribution data is, is inherently sparse. And 
ideally you need to have a, a knowledge of uh, how many species there are in an entire taxonomic group to make an inference to make a reliable inference uh, for a subset uh, of that species let's say species that occur only in tropical forests so these are some reasons why it's quite challenging to count species in general um, so I was working with uh, geographic range maps at the time uh, when these ideas uh, started to form and uh, geographic range maps, they represent broad spatial distributions of species. So they are uh, rather coarse, but, you know, but they are complete for uh, the four terrestrial vertebrate uh, taxonomic groups, mammals, birds, reptiles, and amphibians. And they are uh, available from well-published and reliable sources such as the IUCN Red List, as well as uh, a few other papers in uh, in high-profile journals such as Nature Ecology and Evolution and like current biology. So the light above me is um, has got a motion sensor. So if you see me wave, I'm waving at the light to bring it on. Sorry about that. Um, uh, yeah. So uh, these geographic range maps uh, were a critical source of data for me and were a complete set of data sets for four taxonomic, vertebrate taxonomic groups. So um, to answer the question of how many species occur in tropical forests, so what I generally did was I took the tropical forest biome map from Dynasty et al. And then I overlaid it with species range maps. So for all of these four taxonomic groups, I'm showing the giant panda here purposely. So the giant panda is a really well-known species of mammal, um, very charismatic species of mammal that occurs in the forests of China. And if uh, it overlaps with the tropical forest biome in that red, red, red square area that you see on the left map. So um, if you were to just look at the range map and make your inferences based on the range map, you would definitely conclude that the giant panda occurs in tropical forests, but you would be wrong because range maps are prone to a form of error called commission errors or false positive errors, where a species may actually overlap a given habitat type, such as tropical forests, but that species may not actually use that habitat type. You know, so, um, so if you look at the data on habitat preferences for the giant panda, you'll see that it occurs in temperate forests, actually. So the IUCN, in addition to these range maps, they have uh, extensive data sets on the uh, habitat reference types for each species. And you can use that as a second filter to kind of remove these false positive errors. So the giant panda would not be in my list of tropical forest species for this reason. So this is an example of um, uh, you know, removing a false positive error, uh, a protocol that I followed for my work. So what I did overall was to combine the tropical forest biome map with the range map and then the habitat data to first um, uh, you know, calculate the total number of species uh, globally, and then uh, figure out that on average across these four taxonomic groups, 62% of uh, all, tropical, all terrestrial vertebrate species, that is nearly two thirds of them um, occur in tropical forests. So other than reptiles, all other three groups, it's well over half. So, Wilson was certainly right, but we, uh, in, our, in this work, which was recently published last year in Frontiers in Ecology and Environment, provide um, uh, the first uh, uh, empirical data to, to show that this is indeed the case, at least for terrestrial vertebrates. Now, reptiles are slightly lower than 50%, but we think our, our, our estimate may be an underestimate here, mainly because habitat preference data for reptiles is not fully complete. So as that becomes complete, it's, it's possible that more species will be added to the tropical forest list for reptiles. Uh, beyond this, uh, beyond just uh, estimating um, the number of species in tropical forests, I, I went a step further because tropical forests can be divided into four types. Uh, the most uh, famous or the most uh, well-known are these tropical rainforests. They are also known as humid tropical forests, and I'll be talking in much more detail about them on the next part of my talk. But um, tropical rainforests are often regarded as the true champions of vertebrate diversity. So um, I, I, I wanted to figure out how many species that actually occur in tropical forests also overlap with humid tropical forests. So of the four uh, uh, types of tropical forests, humid, 
dry tropical forests, mangroves, and then coniferous tropical forests. Uh, more than 90% of the species that actually occur in tropical forests also have range overlaps with uh, the human tropical biome. Uh, so tropical rainforests are indeed the true champions of vertebrate diversity, as uh, the data shows. Um, going further, I'm going to talk about the second part of my work right now and uh, about the biodiversity benefits of uh, intact tropical forests. Um, this is a, a work that's currently under peer review. Um, so when I talk about intactness or rainforest intactness, I'm referring to the vertical structure of the rainforest. So uh, people who have actually done field work or have visited rainforests, uh, primary forests or old growth forests will be familiar with this kind of structure where a native tropical rainforest in intact condition would have a really tall emergent layer of trees that are, uh, let's say, 80 to maybe even 100 meters tall uh, and poking above the main canopy. And then the main canopy is, is, is completely closed. Uh, and you have a multi-story structure with, the, uh, with a mid-story below the main canopy. Then you have an understory. You have a shrub layer and a ground layer. So if you were to be uh, walking in these forests, depending on the terrain, it would be relatively straightforward to walk through these forests because the ground, uh, the, the ground layer is not very dense, typically. It's relatively open. So this is what a photograph of a relatively intact uh, rainforest would look like. And this is what a degraded forest would look like, where what I'm showing is an edge habitat where uh, most of the forest has been removed and barring um, some patches. And uh, in these kinds of degraded forests, what you often have is the emergent layer is pretty much completely gone. There's no big trees left. Uh, most of the canopy layer is, is gone. It's completely open. And there's a very dense understory. So if you had to walk through these logged forests, such as I had to do in Borneo, you would need to have a machete to hack your way through typically. So as you can see here, overall, uh, this, this shows that the concept of forest cover is um, you know, rather, it's a very binary thing. So all forest cover is not equal. So you have really good quality forest cover based on the condition of the forest, and you have a gradient that goes all the way to a very highly degraded forest. So in 2019, uh, Professor Andrew Hansen at Montana State University, a major collaborator of mine here for my work uh, as, a, as a postdoc here, he came up with this uh, uh, data set that he initially published in scientific data. Uh, and this was the first uh, attempt to my knowledge of trying to move beyond the concept of forest cover and to uh, distinguish um, uh, a gradient of forest quality based on two different indices that he came up with. This was uh, a humid tropical forest layer or rainforest layer. So Andy Hansen came up with uh, two indices. The first one is called the structural condition index. And that's based on the percentage canopy cover, the year since the forest was disturbed and canopy height. And this index ranges from, uh, it's a continuous index ranging from, my, from one to 18, where the lowest values are basically really degraded or almost non-forest. Uh, they are less than five meters tall, disturbed since very recently and have less than 25% canopy cover. And the highest values representing um, from 14, um, from value 14 to 18, uh, are much taller forests, greater than 15 meters tall, um, undisturbed since 2000, and uh, are much more contiguous in their canopy cover. So the, this index is focused only on the structural condition of the forest. However, the, the condition of a forest may not necessarily reveal uh, certain kinds of pressures uh, that might uh, be very difficult to quantify, especially with remote sensing. For example, there might be hunting within these forests. So it might look structurally intact, but there's hunting and then uh, there's biodiversity loss. There might be small roads, there might be um, you know, settlements and stuff that can be concealed uh, by the canopy. And so um, what Andy Henson did was in an attempt to quantify these kinds of uh, pressures, was to overlay the structural condition index with the human footprint. Many of you may be familiar with the human footprint because of Vasco Venter's work. So um, this was originally produced by Eric Sanderson in 2003, I believe. Oscar Venter updated it in 2016. And Brooke Williams, uh, who's also at UQ, I believe, 
Um, she updated it in 2020 in, in the journal One Earth. So the human footprint is a cumulative map of eight pressures. And so they overlaid it on the structural condition index. So now you have a map of not only for a structural condition as well as pressure. So previous work has um, uh, found out that um, there's a threshold of the human footprint that is anything greater than four, uh, a pressure level greater than four uh, would likely be associated with very strong likelihood of species extinctions and uh, biodiversity declines. So um, uh, 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 this structural integrity index, which combines the uh, condition as well as the human footprint, you now have the ability to um, get a, a proxy for the human pressures. So you have really high quality forests that are intact structurally as well as uh, have a human footprint of less than equal to four. And that's your uh, you know, remotely sensed high integrity forests. So um, in 2020, Andy Hansen published a follow-on work in Nature, Ecology, and Evolution where they uh, calculated that of the entire global uh, rainforest estate that is remaining, only half is actually in this intact, undisturbed natural condition of really uh, intact structure and human pressure less than equal to four. And of this 50% that remains, um, the, the vast majority remains unprotected. So these really high quality, the so-called best of the last rainforest remain un unprotected. And so with this work overall, Hansen and colleagues were essentially trying to, um, you know, uh, change the conversation a bit and move away from the focus on forest cover. We often, in our analyses, we often uh, focus on a biodiversity response variable in relation to uh, a binary response of like forest cover forest present or not, or at the most an area of forest, the extent of forest. So for the first time, we were able to uh, get beyond forest cover and try to get at uh, forest quality based on these two metrics. Also, um, very recent work, uh, approximately at the time when I was starting my postdoc, uh, came around which uh, you know showed that undisturbed native forests and intact wilderness areas are really important for biodiversity. But there was a research gap in that there's hardly anything known about the role that the best of the last rainforests that are identified by Hansen et al. Uh, can have in mitigating extinction risk for biodiversity. So this was an opportune moment for me to kind of use these new indices uh, to explore the idea uh, about whether or not uh, forest quality is actually really important for um, uh, preventing biodiversity loss. So using these remotely sensed data, um, I uh, had the objective to quantify the association between rainforest quality as structural condition as well as integrity, which is condition plus pressure within the ranges of the thousands of vertebrate species that I had previously worked with. Uh, and I wanted to quantify the association between rainforest quality and two IUCN variables that is whether the species is threatened or not, and whether the population trend is showing as declining or not. To the best of my knowledge, uh, this represented the first known test of whether forest uh, structural condition and integrity variables, um, you know, the relative importance of these variables compared with what is typically used, which is forest cover alone. You know, so this was a fairly unique opportunity uh, uh, when we started working with this. So the methods I used uh, for this was, first of all, I resampled the, the SCI and FSI rasters to one kilometer resolution, uh, which is the resolution of the human footprint. And then I classified them into low, medium, and high categories, uh, high meaning really intact uh, forests with under low human pressures. And then I overlaid uh, them on the geographic range maps that I had previously used for my uh, Frontiers paper. And so I also classified species into rainforest endemic as well as non-endemic based on their, um, you know, on the idea that um, endemic species that are obligate rainforest species might show a stronger uh, association with uh, high quality rainforest than non-endemic species. To give you an example, uh, let's go to the range map of the Western gorilla, which is in um, West and Central Africa. And this is the known geographic range of the species. So I overlaid this, the range of the species with the SCI index over here. So the lighter colors of the SA index uh, represent greater forest quality, uh, forest condition, structural condition, and the darker colors are um, progressively lower and lower quality. 
it is highly degraded forests. So I was able to, uh, you know, extract the number of pixels, the number of one kilometer pixels, one square kilometer pixels in each of these 18 or 19 different uh, classes, and then classify the amount of low, uh, medium and high uh, pixels, the area the, the in square kilometers within the range of, of the species. So when you look at the data, you will see that uh, if you were to just consider intactness, uh, uh, sorry, structural condition alone, the green, uh, so the green, the green bars, you'll see that 66% of the of the known geographic global range of the Western gorilla is intact structural condition. So that seems a pretty good number. It's, it's really good. But when you factor in pressure, that is the structural integrity index, that number drops to 41%. So knowing what we know about human pressure within the ranges of species, that is a worrying sign. And so pressure really does matter. So it's not a, just about intactness alone. So I did this process repetitively for more than 16,000 species. And I extracted three variables from this. Um, um, one was like um, forest cover, uh, structural condition and integrity. And I calculated the relative difference between, for example, forest and non-forest, high and low structural condition within the range of each species. So uh, basically I'm standardizing these variables all between minus and plus one. So uh, for example, a positive value for forest cover here would mean that a greater uh, amount of area within the range of a species is covered by forest than non-forest. Um, and similarly for integrity, if it's a positive number, it would mean that a greater amount of area within the range of a species is covered by high integrity forest than low integrity forest. So, and the negative number is complete, is, it would be the complete opposite. So it's all standardized to the same scale. Um, and my statistical methods were, uh, I, had two, I had two response variables, uh, the probability of a species being threatened or not, and the probability of a species being uh, declining in population or not. And three uh, like predictive variables, and, and, and I'm interested in looking at the relative importance of forest cover, structural condition, and integrity. So I had a binary response variable and three continuous predictive variables. I used a generalized linear model uh, framework specifically a logistic regression framework for my entire analysis. Now I am working with uh, thousands of species at a time. And these species are not statistically independent because they are evolutionarily related and the degree of evolutionary relatedness varies. So when you are uh, analyzing this kind of data, you typically need to account for this kind of phylogenetic dependence. And I actually found a strong phylogenetic signal using uh, a measure known as Pagel's lambda. So um, uh, I obtained the uh, phylogenetic trees for all four taxonomic groups. Um, all of these trees come from Walter Yates's lab. Walter Yates is a professor at Yale, and he is basically the pioneer in this kind of phylogenetic work. So I was able to obtain the trees from all of these uh, for all of these taxonomic groups. And I was able to fit phylogenetic regression models for these. So how this works is basically it calculates a phylogenetic correlation, a pairwise correlation between each uh, pair of species um, and, and factors that in explicitly into your analysis. So you're correcting for this uh, potential um, confounding effect of phylogeny here uh, in this kind of an analysis. So uh, I'm giving you the results in one slide. Sorry for the uh, all of everything in one slide. So the overall result that you get here is that forest integrity, which is your intact structural condition and low human pressures is actually really strongly associated with a lower likelihood of species being threatened and having a declining population. So if you look at uh, the green uh, dots and squares, uh, they represent the forest integrity. So the higher the, the greater the area of high integrity forests, for example, in the uh, within the geographic range of threatened mammals here there is the closed green circle or the filled green circle uh, so the odds of being threatened are like approximately uh, 0.4 whereas if you look at the forest cover the red uh, for mammals uh, uh, the the red filled circle that's approximately 1.32 so you uh, so you kind of like um, almost it's less than half uh, in terms of the probability or the odds of being threatened. Um, overall, the trend generally shows that um, structural condition alone does tend to have 
a positive effect. So the, the more the intact, structurally intact the forests are, the better it is compared to forest cover as such, like that doesn't account for any of these pressures or uh, structure, but it is not as good as integrity. So um, uh, this trend was generally consistent for across all taxonomic groups, as you can see. And we had we sh we uh, can see the strongest trends in general in amphibians, um, and this was also consistent generally for both endemic and non-endemic species. So possibly because and even species that are not endemic to um, you know um, a tropical rainforest, they still use they 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 still use uh, um, tropical rainforests as refugia or as, as uh, they are important habitats for them, even though they may not be endemic. Um, so generally, you know, forest cover uh, that is really, really of high integrity is critical for, uh, is like, is very strongly associated for, with low risk of extinction and population decline uh, across human tropical vertebrates. So based on these findings, a potential solution that we might suggest to prevent extinctions in, in rainforest habitats uh, might be this concept of forest integrity. So uh, this Convention on Biological Diversity is a post-2020 global biodiversity framework, which is currently in, in an advanced draft stage. Um, for the first time, in, to my, I, I believe, um, come, uh, you know, bring, um, uh, talks about this concept of integrity. And they actually have language in, in the current uh, draft that says uh, net gain in the area and integrity of terrestrial ecosystems would be important. So it might be really important to mandate something like this to, to prevent biodiversity loss, given the rate at which uh, uh, tropical forest deforestation and degradation is going on. Um, a preprint of this, an earlier version of this work is available on Research Square. It's available at this link. And um, I would like to thank uh, my lab here at UNBC, especially Jose Aragon, who's a co-author on the paper uh, for helping with GIS work. I would like to thank collaborators Scott Getz and Patrick Jans at Northern Arizona University. I would like to thank collaborators at UNDP who helped with the policy part of the paper, Christina Suppos and Annie Bernick, and all other members and co-authors on the paper, as well as NASA for funding. Uh, thank you very much, and I'll take your questions. Wow, thank you, Rajiv. That was a uh, inspiring talk.